The, the final speaker of this morning's session is uh, Lauren Reesberg from the Department of uh, Botany at uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, Lauren's work focuses on the events that take place in and between populations during the formation of new plant species. And he's, like many of our speakers, has, uh, has numerous awards. Uh, he's a recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship that was specifically for his innovative approaches using both experimental and theoretical methods to the identification of how new species uh, form. Of course, a special interest of uh, many people, tracing back to, to Darwin and before. Lauren's chosen system is the sunflower, which is a domesticated plant that's native to North America. So he's going to talk to us about uh, the sunflower genome and its evolution. So before I begin, I want to first thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. I've never been to JGI before, so this is a real pleasure. It's my first time to this symposium. And I think the things I study are probably um, at the edge of the interest of this audience. So you'll see I'm covering a number of different topics that hopefully will interest some of you. Also, I am not from Hollywood, so um, you will not be seeing exciting stuff like Bob just presented. Um, I'm sorry about that. I always seem to always end up after the most exciting speaker, and it's not really fair. Um, so, you know, it's like with the fungus and the salaginella. Uh, why do we care about sunflowers? And um, I'm going to try to make the case, and, and citrus as well. So there's been this sort of um, 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 arguments as why we would care about these plants. Um, sunflower, here we go. Um, it's a globally important crop. It's worth about eight billion. If we rank it in terms of the um, area harvested, it ranks 11th um, of all crops. For this audience, it turns out that sunflower is the only major crop that originated, that was domesticated in North America, actually in eastern North America. And so it's the cornerstone of the hypothesis that there was an independent um, origin of agriculture in North America. Um, it also, and this is why I care about it, it's been a useful model for understanding uh, um, how species originate. And then more recently, Steve Knapp in particular has pointed out that it has potential for cellulosic biomass production. And the reason for this is that there are drought tolerant uh, wild sunflowers that have woody stems. And so I'm going to try to touch on a number of these topics throughout the talk. So in terms of wood, I decided I would say something about wood since it's such a, a, an important topic here at JGI. And um, um, sunflower is, it turns out to be a useful model for studying the evolution of, of woodiness. And the reason is that it's, it's um, uh, originated several times within the genus, among, even among fairly closely related species. For example, um, you can see that it, in the, the, this is the Helianthus annuus is the common sunflower, which gave rise to the domesticated sunflower. And you can see that there are three species in this little cluster that actually have originated, um, 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 that have a wood, wood formation. And the wood formation seems to have arisen independently each time. And one of these species is a particular interest here. It's this Helianthus wintry. I'll show it um, um, in the next slide. And this uh, uh, species is of interest because it's only recently discovered here in California on the foothills of the Sierra Nevada is actually by John Stebbins here in the Berkeley area. And it's quite remarkable, first of all, that you could discover a new sunflower species or any species, in, a plant species in California. But also, this one is, is remarkable. I initially thought that it was just an ecotype of Helianthus annuus. But when we do genetic studies, um, genome scans, we find that it, it really is distinct. It is closely related to the common sunflower. Um, it flowers all year long, which is why it's called winter eye. It flowers during the winter. And as you can see, it's a nice little tree. And, and this, we think that this is very recently derived, um, um, probably in the last uh, uh, 5,000 years since the Holocene. And yet there seems to be no gene flow ongoing with the, the, the common sunflower that grows nearby. So what I'm going to do is ask three questions. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask, when will we have a reference sequence for sunflower? There are probably two people in this audience that care about this question, but I will raise it anyways. Um, it is just another genome, um, but we care about it. And in fact, some people said, well, isn't it already done? Well, no, it's not. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, the problems we're having and, and how we're trying to, to, to solve those. Um, the second question we want to address is, is it possible to develop sunflower cultivars or to breed sunflower cultivars with favorable cellulosic biomass traits. And we'll talk about some of the genetic studies we and our collaborators have, have, have performed to try to address this question. 
And then finally, I'm going to switch over to a more um, evolutionary question that I I'm, I'm, uh, have been fascinated with for some time, and that is how repeatable is plant speciation? But now we're able to take these studies to the genome level, and we'll talk about some new data showing that actually um, um, plant speciation is, is, at the genome level, is, is, is surprisingly repeatable. So why, are we, why isn't the sunflower genome done? And uh, one reason is, is that um, it's big. And it's about uh, uh, 3.6 gigabases. And um, as far as I'm aware, um, um, there hasn't been a larger genome published to date, although I imagine that we'll see one before we get the sunflower genome out. It's about the same size as the opossum genome, slightly larger. Um, I'm bigger, of course, than the human genome or, or maize. Um, another problem is, of course, if you have a large genome, not surprisingly, it's mostly comprised of repetitive sequences. And in sunflower, it's about 81% of a, a, a repetitive. And a full 58% of the genome are, is one LTR retrotransposon family. I hate this family. It's called Thai 3 gypsy. And um, it's caused us um, um, a, a large number of problems. But it gets worse. This is the biggest problem. If you actually look at the age distribution of these um, LTR retrotransposon insertions, they all, most, the vast majority have occurred very recently within the last one million years. And this makes assembly a real, real challenge. And this is the biggest problem we're having. It turns out that this is very predictive. The age structure of LTR retrotransposons is very predictive of how easy or how well a, a, a genome will assemble. And then finally, to add to it, um, um, sunflower is an ancient octoploid. It's actually much more, it, these, are, these are just the polyploidizations that have happened in the last 50 million years. Um, there have been a lot more um, um, throughout the, the history of, of angiosperms. But we have um, a, uh, a hexaploid event, which seems to be very common in flowering plant evolution. In our case, we've been able to actually discriminate it into two polyploidization events near here at the base of the composite. And then about 20 million years ago, there was another polypodization event at the base of the, the, the um, um, Helianthii. And this work has mainly been worked out by a former postdoc of mine, Mike Barker, as well as uh, John Bowers at the University of Georgia, using a combination of looking at the age distribution of duplicate genes as well as syntony analyses in comparison to uh, a grape, for example. So the strategy we took based on these challenges is as follows. Um, we first of all have made a very high density uh, genetic map uh, of the sunflower genome. We then uh, produced a sequence based uh, physical map which allows us to sort of um, um, get resolution within the uh, bins in the genetic map. Uh, and then because it's a sequence based map, we actually have sequence tags every 5 to 6 KB across um, each back. And then the idea is that we assemble the whole genome uh, shotgun sequence data. This has been where our problem is actually. And then we uh, align the sequence contigs um, against the genetic and physical map. And then the idea is that once we do, we have this, uh, these sequence contigs aligned, we then do local scaffolding back by back across the genome uh, with mate pairs. And then finally, when we have a fixed assembly, we annotate. Well, right now, we're sort of in this stage of we're still not satisfied with the uh, um, assembly from the whole genome shotgun sequence, so we haven't. We've been developing pipelines for this, uh, for the local scaffolding, but we're still waiting for a, a really good assembly uh, uh, before we go forward. So I'll give you sort of a, an update of what we're doing. Uh, one thing is, is that we do have a very nice genetic map. We did this just by sequencing recombinant inbred lines to about 1x depth on the Illumina platform. And this allowed us to map about 2 million, uh, 2.6 million SNPs. We actually weren't mapping the SNPs themselves. We were mapping the contigs that contain the SNPs. And this map we presented here, Chris presented it here in terms of a sunflower head. And really what you're seeing here is each of these concentric circles, they're not seeds. They're actually each recombinant inbred line with the blocks, uh, uh, with parental chromosomal blocks in black from one parent, white from the other. So you can see each recombination in the 96 recombinant inbred lines. And then at the out here in the white area, which you can't see, are actually each of the bins of the genetic markers, and then the black regions are the chromosomes, all 17 of them, and then the number of base pairs that map to each uh, centimorgan 
are uh, uh, indicated by in the ray, the yellow rays. And so you can see that usually there's one very long ray on each chromosome. And we think that that might be the centromere, but we're not sure. So the approach we've been taking for the physical map is we said uh, we really liked uh, uh, KeyGene's uh, um, sort of whole genome profiling strategy. So we subcontracted this out to them. And what they do is they simply make uh, 2D uh, pools of, of back clones. And the idea is you then restrict from, you use a restriction enzyme to restrict the backs um, in, the, in each of the pools and then uh, uh, amplify and sequence from the terminal ends of restriction fragments. And what this does is it gives you a, a sequence tag about every two to six KB uh, across the, the back. And then these sequence tags can be used to make the physical map using the FPC software, just like a normal sort of uh, uh, length-based fingerprinting approach. And um, it's worked quite well in producing a physical map for a sunflower. Uh, one of my postdocs, Navdeep Gill, has been responsible for sort of optimizing this map. And right now what we have is we have a 12.5x a back map, and we end up covering about 97% of the genome with 3,300 contigs. And we think we can actually get this better because there's still, we filtered out most of the chimeric backs, but not all of them. And so we're still working to, to try to improve this assembly. And, when, and you can see this from when we try to integrate the genetic and physical map. It works fairly well. About 78% of the back contigs map to a single position on the genetic map, but then there are 22% that do not. And uh, the reason this is, is we think it's mostly because of paralogy or gene, uh, duplicated genes, but at least some of it, we think, is due to chimeric backs. And you can also see similar figures for the, the singleton backs. So the sequencing, there's not much to say here. We've just done a lot of it. Uh, we're almost done. We're not, as I said, completely satisfied with our current assembly, so that what we're doing is, is we're doing some FOSMID uh, in sequencing, and um, hopefully that will, will solve uh, our problems. Um, this is our current assembly. It was actually done last summer. We haven't made much improvement since then. And the problem has been is that putting all of the data into our computers keeps on crashing them. And so we're, we're now resorting to a brute force. We're buying a one terabyte um, um, machine, and, and hopefully that will, will help. Um, Oh, just to say, so right, 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 right now, our N50 is about 190 KB. We cover most of the genome, um, but we're not very satisfied with that. And obviously, with the local assemblies, we'll do a lot better, but we want to do much, much, much better, and, and even starting the local assemblies on each back. Um, the method does seem look like it's going to, to work when we align the uh, sequence contigs or scaffolds against the physical tags and the genetic markers. Uh, once we have uh, uh, links of about 15 to 20 KB, um, there's almost all of them will then align nicely to the, to the uh, physical and genetic map. The annotation, um, we've done a lot of EST sequencing. JGI actually did a lot of our initial Sanger-based EST sequencing and produced wonderful ESTs for us. Um, of course, for the annotation project, we're doing a lot of uh, deep sequencing with Illumina. And our collaborators at ENRA um, have trained and optimized a, a gene finder program for Sunflower, and so they tell me that as soon as I give them a fixed assembly, they're going to return the annotation in a month. Um, well, so, so our hope is that in December of this year, we'll, we'll have a, a, a good genome, but we'll see. So that was kind of um, um, fairly uh, boring, descriptive um, uh, genome stuff. And now I'm going to ask sort of a question that might be of greater interest in, can we develop sunflower cultivars with favorable um, um, cellulosic biomass traits? And this work has been done with, with collaboration with, with uh, two labs at the University of Georgia, Steve Knapp, who's now left, and John Burke. And, and Jessica Barb has been the postdoc leading this, this project. And she put together this wortle that sort of provides uh, um, some ideas of what an ideal feed, some of the characteristics of an ideal feedstock. And um, I'm glad that, that Jody and others have talked about wood and lignin, because I don't have to. But one of the things you want is you want a high SG lignin ratio. Um, it's also good to have high cellulose. It's nice if it's drought tolerant, um, adaptable, low lignin. It's also good if it's a dual purpose crop. And certainly this is the case for a sunflower. Probably the most likely, at least immediate use of sunflower, uh, a woody sunflower cultivar would be in uh, developing countries in subsistence agriculture. Uh, we work with. Um, um, 
local farmers in Ethiopia on a seed oil, an indigenous seed oil similar to, sun, closely related to sunflower called noug. And they prefer noug for eating, but they also have sunflowers in their sort of border rows between the crops. And they would be, they're very enthusiastic about the idea of having a, a dual purpose um, um, sunflower cultivars that had both wood and produced um, um, seeds. And so they're very enthusiastic about this. So I think it actually might be um, um, useful if we, because they need firewood and charcoal and, and uh, 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 woody sunflower cultivars could provide this. And it wouldn't be a big change in, in their current sort of agricultural strategies. Um, so what do we know about the wood composition in sunflower? And this work was done by the DOE, uh, the, their, uh, and the wood laboratories. And um, what you can see, it's, it's actually fairly similar to other um, um, cellulosic, uh, uh, potential cellulosic biofuel feedstocks. Um, it has too much lignin, um, and it has a fairly good um, SG uh, lignin ratio and, and quite a bit of, of cellulose. So what we've been doing is we've been working with a population, uh, a, ma a, a genetic uh, mapping population between the cultivated sunflower and a woody wild relative called the silver leaf sunflower. This is a drought tolerant annual. It's a very, very large late flowering species that occurs on the Texas coastal plain. And it produces uh, a fairly high quality wood. And um, so these are the phenotypic data. We grew this, this large back cross population um, in uh, the University of Georgia, Iowa, and the University of British Columbia. And it turns out that the news is quite good. We get transgressive segregation or extreme phenotypes are produced for all of the key sort of um, um, cellulosic biomass traits. For example, you can see that there's uh, uh, strong transgressive segregation for, for reduced uh, total lignin content, also for high SG lignin ratio, uh, for, for uh, uh, C6 sugars relative to total lignin. So this is all good news. There is variation upon which we could, we could use in, in, in breeding programs. Another issue, of course, are genetic correlations. Um, if the genetic correlations are in the wrong direction or the hot, strong correlations, uh, uh, it will inhibit uh, uh, breeding. And it turns out that the correlations are quite good. Uh, for example, lignin and carbohydrate content are negatively correlated. And this is very good. It means that we could breed for high carbohydrate content, and we actually would get lower lignin rather than higher lignin. Um, also, at, um, S lignin and G lignin are not correlated. And so what this means is, is that we could uh, easily breed for high SG lignin ratios. And so it should be possible to develop sunflower cultivars with favorable cellulosic biomass traits. The one thing, however, we haven't shown is that we could actually do a dual use sunflower. It might very well be that if we get favorable cellulosic biomass traits, it might be accompanied by a reduction in yield or oil, or oil uh, quality and so forth. Um, we have done a lot of genetic work. Um, uh, this is actually uh, QTL data from two different genetic maps for sunflower, two different mapping populations. Um, um, and, and what you can see is that we've highlighted in red some of the regions that might be useful in breeding. For example, uh, down here at the bottom of, of chromosome 13, there are a lot of um, um, uh, biomass QTLs that would certainly be, be useful to, in, in, a, in a breeding program. Okay, now we'll move to something that I, I'm actually more interested in, that is, 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 is plant speciation, and, and particularly the repeatability of, of speciation at the genomic level. And um, we can sort of go back to, to some of the comments. The, the idea of how repeatable evolution has been quite controversial among evolutionary biologists. Microevolutionists think that the process is much more deterministic and repeatable whereas macroevolutionists point out the importance of historical contingency and so forth. And for example, um, um, Stephen Gould argued that if we rewound the tape of life, um, we would end up with a very different array of, of end products. Um, but others, um, um, particularly microevolutionists, have pointed out to some sort of fairly um, um, astounding examples of the, the parallel evolution of, of certain species and certain traits. And, and the surprising thing about all of this is, is that although we know a lot about the repeatability of evolution at the phenotypic level, we actually know very little at the genomic level. And yet with the tools that we have, it's now very, very easy, much easier to look at genomic levels of, of repeatability than it ever was to look at phenotypic uh, um, um, uh, 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 parallel evolution. 
And so um, I've been trying to, to sort of get at this uh, question using uh, sunflower species, of course. And to do this, what I've done is I've focused on two pairs of sister species. Um, one of them we've already talked about. This is the silverleaf sunflower, Helianthus argophyllus, which has these, um, which is this woody um, um, annual species from the Texas coastal plain. The other is the common sunflower, which is the progenitor of the domesticated sunflower. And these are sister species. The other pair we've been looking at is Helianthus devilus, another species from, the, from Texas, but uh, um, far further into the interior of Texas. And then Helianthus pedialaris, which has this wide distribution. It's called the prairie sunflower and is distri distributed across the prairies. Both of these species diverged about 1, 2, 1 to 2 million years ago, and we know that it was in, seems to have been, uh, occurred in allopatry, or in, they're geographically isolated. Um, uh, we think that the Debilis pedialaris split was a bit more recent than the Annuus argophyllus split, but they're fairly similar in divergence times. So what we've done here to look at um, um, evolution across the genome is we've used transcriptome sequencing. And this was before the sequencing costs have come down. Uh, now we, if we were redoing it, we'd probably just do whole genome shotgun sequencing. In fact, we are redoing it, but it'll take us a year or two to get the data. And so we used both Illumina and 454 sequencing platforms. Early on, we were using mainly uh, normalized cDNA libraries because still the sequencing costs were, were quite high. Now we just do sort of um, um, RNA-seq. And we have 109 genotypes of the four species. And so for data analysis, what we've done is we've calculated a measure of differentiation between, each of the, between the species pairs, the sister species pairs. And the measure of differentiation we've used is FST, which is widely used in population genetics. Um, but we probably get the same results with any other sort of measure of differentiation. And then we've conducted one Santa Morgan sliding window analyses across the genomes to, um, to look at patterns of differentiation across each linkage group. And um, so this is what we find. And um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at, at these, these graphs here. So what we have here is on the y-axis we have FST, which is the major differentiation. And then on the um, x-axis we have the chromosome or uh, centimorgan distances along the linkage group. And then we're just showing this one centimorgan sliding window analysis across the chromosome. Um, and this is for one sister pair, Annuus argophyllus, and this is for the other sister pair, Helianthus devilus. Now, what I want to point out is the similarity of these patterns of differentiation. Uh, for example, you can see that this peak is found in both uh, um, um, pairs. Remember, these pairs diverged independently. Um, there's, no shared, there's no shared history between them. You also see, for example, this double peak here is also here. You can see this sort of end feature is the same basically in both species pairs. So the, the overall pattern is quite similar, and we'll, we'll present some statistics shortly. But I want to contrast this with what's going on in chromosome 3. Here we find almost no similarity in the pattern of differentiation across the chromosome, almost none. I have no idea why this is. I'll give you some possible suggestions later on. But it's, it's very difficult to find even one similar feature between these two um, uh, between on chromosome 3 across the genome. If we do the statistics, they actually follow what we'd expect based on our visual analysis. What you can see is for chromosome 1, the R squared value, the degree of similarity in the patterns of genomic differentiation on chromosome 1 turns out to be quite high in R squared of 0.62. That's actually very, very high. Um, in con although the levels of differentiation are slightly higher in annuus argophyllus than they are in pedialaris devilus. Um, in contrast, on chromosome 3, you can see almost no uh, 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 repeatability in patterns of differentiation and R square of 0.1. If we look at this across the genome, you can see that the R square values are, are varying dramatically across, across the genome. The highest one is indeed chromosome 1, and the lowest one is chromosome 3. So those are the ones that I just showed you. But you can see that there are quite a number of these are quite high, and the average across the entire genome is about 0.3. Um, so why are patterns of genomic divergence repeatable? Um, so there are a number of possibilities. One thing I didn't show you, but it turns out that in the fixed differences are where you see the greatest uh, repeatability. That is, these are the differences that were driven by natural selection. And so we think that part of what we're seeing is that some genes simply matter more than others, 
and their importance is correlated across species. Now, we're not talking about parallel um, um, adaptation to similar habitats. These are actually adaptation to different habitats, but the same genes are exploited over and over again. A second thing that we think is going on is that independently divergent lineages probably share heterogeneity in mutation rates across the genome. And so if most of the differentiation is happening in the absence of gene flow, this would be interspecific gene flow, which we think is the case because this was allopatric, then areas of the genome with higher mutation rates will diverge faster. We also suspect that the independently diverging lineages will share heterogeneity in recombination rates. In fact, we know that this is the case. And so deleterious alleles will be culled less effectively from regions of low recombination. And then finally, we suspect that genes vary in selective constraints, and such constraints are correlated across independently diverging lineages. In fact, one of the greatest predictors of, of levels of divergence of genes turns out to be expression breadth and expression level. And so we expect that this uh, contributes to the patterns as well. In fact, we think that the three things that are important are one, two, and three. We think one mainly explains the really high divergence SNPs, and then two and three um, sort of the overall pattern across the genome. But we're still working to try to prove these things. So I, I need to conclude as I've run out of time. Um, so the main conclusions are that the um, um, assembly of the sunflower genome is, is quite challenging. Uh, this is just an excuse. Uh, we don't have it done yet. Um, because of its large size past polyploidization events and recent amplification of LTR retrotransposons, this last factor is most important. Uh, although we do think our strategy of using these high density uh, genetic and physical maps for scaffolding of, of the sequence contigs uh, will work. Uh, we do see that transgressive segregation of key cellulosic biomass traits and favorable genetic correlation should permit us to breed a sunflower biofuel feedstock. And then finally, patterns of genomic divergence during speciation are surprisingly repeatable, especially in highly differentiated genomic regions. And then I want to acknowledge um, all the folks that have been involved in this process. I should say that this is not everybody. So I didn't have enough um, 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 space on my slides, but the, the sequencing of the genome project involves myself and, and these investigators here. Um, I probably did not include enough of the investigators on the cellulosic biomass traits, but Jessica Barb has been leading this effort. And then the evolutionary analyses were mainly done by Sebastian Renault, who's a postdoc in my lab. And many different organizations have contributed to funding. So thank you. <laughs>